All right, welcome everybody to our uh, next assembly for the uh, delegates for the DP 0.1 project. Uh, and uh, today we'll have, we're very lucky to have Andrew Bradshaw, who's a member of the uh, camera team, who's actually, as we speak, probably doing some kind of tweaks to the camera, maybe even putting things together for it. Uh, Andrew has uh, finished his PhD at uh, UC Davis, working primarily with Tony Tyson, and has joined us here at Slack uh, maybe about, uh, gosh, I don't even know exactly where it was about two years ago or so. Um, one thing that you might know that Andrew, if everything goes well, might be able to share with us is also a bit of his research that is sort of related to LSST, but only peripherally. Uh, he is also very interested in the effect that the low Earth uh, satellites might have on the quality of the images. And I am assuming that at least we'll be able to hear a few words about that, Andrew, because this is so uh, such an interesting and sort of very uh, apropos subject. Um, before Andrew takes over, I think Melissa will have a few, um, a few announcements. In particular, the main announcement would be how to uh, uh, log into the uh, uh, into well you know how to log into the Rubin science platform but how to uh, open the notebook aspect uh specifically related to the notebook that uh andrew will be talking about so uh, uh go ahead and melissa take it away okay thanks greg i do have a couple of announcements but i i think for as i understand it andrew's talk andrew you're going to use mostly slides and then if you get to a point where you're going to use the notebook we will we'll pause um and show people which notebook they should open or maybe you'll just sort of walk people through a notebook um and just in case i put the link to the slides in the chat window yes okay thumbs up so no need to open any notebooks now um andrew will take you through a talk first um, but do go ahead and log into the science platform and log into the notebook aspect you can at least have that open uh for for later today but there's no need to open a particular notebook now um i have just one other announcement slide for today, which is sort of the same slide we show every time, just to give you a, a sense of what's coming up in the delegate um, assembly schedule. So over here on the right, you have the schedule for upcoming ones. And I just wanted to point out, we had sort of tentatively scheduled um, a delegate assembly for the 14th of January, which it would be on our regular two week schedule, but that is the Friday of the AAAS. And so we are just going to cancel the delegate assembly for that week. And instead we will come back together at the end of January for a special session that's sort of a, a half year in review of data preview 0 0.1. And at that point, we'll be able to give everyone a look forward um, through 2022 and a look forward to phase two, DP 0 0.2 as well um, during that assembly of what that's gonna look like and the timeline for DP 0.2. And we'll be able to present sort of all of that then. And then we'll kind of go back to our regular two week, week, um, two week bi weekly meeting schedule and we'll start setting up new topics for the new year um, in January. So, as always, um, if there's a topic that you want to hear more about, you'd like to request that we put together a presentation for a delegate assembly based on that topic, just message me and let me know what it is you're looking to learn about. And we can try and do that. Or if you've been working away on stuff and if you'd like to present a work in progress or some finished work or a cool little DP0 result, presentations during the delegate assembly of anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes or even a, a, the full first hour, really whatever you wanna do, um, we have this time for you to do it. So if you're interested in presenting anything that you've done, you just message me as well. We'll get that set up for you. Um, let me just add one more thing that uh, we will have the stack club meeting in a week from today those of you who are participating in that certainly you're very welcome to to join in but uh, we will skip the stack clubs during the uh, christmas holidays so uh, i will send you more detailed message but uh, uh the one two sorry three weeks from today from today is of course going to be cancelled so just a quick announcement excellent thanks greg and um the other thing to say is that after our first presentation so during the first hour we will do delegate profiles again um, at 10 a.m and if you're here today and you want to add a delegate profile slide to the slide deck i'm going to put the link to that um, in the chat so as you know for these profiles these 30 second short talk slides i've kind of just been emailing random sets of subsets of people to sort of invite them um, to give a talk just so that we sort of have a random collection of people um, every time. But if you haven't got an email yet, 
you would probably you would for the, the next delegate assembly. But if you're here now and you would like to just give um, a little make a little slide and give a give a 30 second spiel uh, at the halfway point, you can absolutely do that as well today. So as per usual, from now from now we'll go with Andrew's talk. Um, we'll wrap that up around ten, then we'll do some delegate profiles, and then we'll head into our breakout rooms. So same schedule um, as all as every day. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to stop sharing. I'll pause one second for questions about any of that. Just unmute or pop a question in the chat, um, and we'll get Andrew set up to screen share. If there are no questions for Melissa, then I think I can start here. Let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? I hope it was good. Okay, all right. So yeah, it's a real pleasure to have been invited to speak to so many curious scientists and uh, people who are interested in getting ready for the amazing uh, science that Ruben will be doing. Um, <clears throat> today's talk is a little bit different. Uh, it's not necessarily about the science, but about enabling the science. Uh, in particular for Ruben, this is all about image processing. <clears throat> so we get raw images off the telescope, world's largest digital camera. And, uh, you know, it's, it operates very quickly and very precisely, but it, it's, you know, it needs to be fixed up a little bit before you can do science. And so there's a bit of a journey from where that photon gets converted into an electron and falls into a pixel well and collected and then read out. And, uh, and then you have to kind of invert that process and go back to figuring out what that photon was, where it came from and uh, what happened to it along the way. <clears throat> so, um, and also I think it's important to note that uh, this talk will not be about how you can process your own uh, version of the LSST data. This talk is more about what's going on behind the scenes um, and what will be done for you. And so the assumption is that the data that you will be receiving, the images, the catalogs will be as perfect as they can get. And we're working diligently to make that a true statement. Currently, it is, they're not as good as we can get. And, you know, this is a research project. The camera isn't complete yet. We're still optimizing and figuring out how it all works, how the physics of our camera works. And so, uh, so I'm just going to show you a little bit of how the sausage is made. Um, and so, uh, of, of course, this is a huge team effort. Um, and so I really want to thank the camera and DM teams, which I work with on a daily basis. Um, extra special thanks go to my advisor, Aaron Rudman, and um, other researchers at Slack, uh, including Yosuke and Jim, and other, uh, other researchers around the world that have uh, contributed to data that's in this brief talk. So yeah, I was kind of asked to show how the sausage is made. <clears throat> and this uh, was previously would show you how to do that data reduction, but it's, since it's not necessary to kind of show you that, I'm going to show you some of the things that are inside of the data and what's been particularly what's been put into DC2. Um, so, uh, but how the sausage is made, you know, there's three, <laughs> the classic meme, three steps, you know, collect a bunch of photons for 10 years, and then there's some intermediate step, and then at the end we get all this wonderful science. Uh, so the mystery <clears throat> is in that step two, where a bunch of wonderful things happen behind the scenes. And uh, my experience, um, I started out in astronomy as an undergraduate, uh, working on Cepheid variables, doing an undergraduate thesis. And uh, that was amazing, looking at variables. And then I went to Davis, UC Davis, and somehow got attached to Tony Tyson and his wonderful laboratory where he was testing CCDs for the LSST. And that naturally led to this picture on the right. Somehow I found myself next to the world's largest digital camera, uh, throwing up a little peace sign in the clean room. And uh, yeah, so this is kind of maybe a couple of weeks ago. The camera is sitting on this big white box uh, called the Bench for Optical Testing. And uh, so this tiny yellow, uh, sorry, tiny silver ring is kind of the edge of the cryostat and beneath it we have light projectors and things like that that we shine on to here, spots, flats, 
we turn off the lights and take biases and darks. Uh, we can inject kind of cosmic rays into it and look at those. And then all that data gets sucked out of these wires uh, over my head and then uh, into the massive computing system at Slack. And we can process all that wonderful data and uh, yeah, operate the camera. So it's a real privilege to be a part of this team, to operate the data, to touch the hardware, to you know, make photons go into this camera and uh, process them. It's, it's a real privilege. So. Um, so of course, before step one, where you collect photons, you, there's actually step zero where you have to build the camera. And as I said, this is a work in progress. Uh, the bottom panorama is yeah just a few weeks old. What the can't what the Rubin clean room looks like right now. And on the right is the camera, uh, and the camera body is on the left. And so these two parts are uh, disjoint right now. But in a few short months, they will come together. This guy on the right will fly into the thing on the left and so the focal plane will join the uh, camera body the filters the lenses on this uh, camera stand on the left and there will be some more optical testing um, but right now it's it's uh, in this in this state where we're testing without the lenses without the filters just a doer window in between us and the focal plane and so, yeah, there's a little time lapse on the top there of uh, building, uh, reconstructing rafts for the CCDs, uh, you know, rafts of the CCDs, which you can see on the right, top right photo, the focal plane under construction, there's these little open holes and what we're building, Craig Lage and I in the top middle um, time lapse was um, one of those rafts that were inserted into that slot. So. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of hard, hardware experience, hands-on with the hardware, and it's, you know, it was a terrifying thing, but everything seems to be working all right. So uh, once the camera's built, you can go on to collecting the photons, and so these tests are ongoing. The whole focal plane is assembled and working just great, and three types of data that we take to calibrate the camera are bias frames with zero-second exposures, and one of the main things we learn about here is what does the camera do what does it look like when you have nothing put in there? And so it should just be mostly read noise. And so this is actually a plot on the left of read noise for all 3000 channels of all 200 CCDs. And you can see, uh, you know, the threshold, nominal threshold is about 10 electrons of noise. And so everything that's maybe darker than kind of a middle gray is good. Things that are white are things we need to focus on. And um, perhaps there's some sort of light leak in some of these sensors that are elevating that read noise. And so, you know, it's a research project. Uh, a dark image is shown in the middle. This was a funny one. When we turned it on for testing this most recent time, we got a lovely heart back from the focal plane. And by lovely, I mean, it was worrying because, you know, it should be dark. You shouldn't be seeing hearts, but uh, it was nice. This was just a little light leak that we had to cover up. Um, but yeah, we got a nice heart and also this question mark um down here so heart and a question mark what a what could be more beautiful for starting up the camera one of the last times we're um testing it and on the right you see a flat field image um so this is using this projector this light projector beneath the focal plane and you can uh, yeah shine light on it and get a very flat light i actually was part of um flattening this light to make it less peaky in the middle and brighter on the edges. And I think that has been a success. So lots of hardware work going on behind the scenes to get it ready. And um, so once you have these images, you know, biases, darks, and flats, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, there is this classical instrument signature removal. And to summarize it, you could just say science, you take the light images and you subtract the dark images, what you get without light, and then you divide by the flat, which is kind of the response of the camera to the system. And uh, <clears throat> so this is how ISR, you know, proceeds in a spherical cow approximation of, um, of instrument signature removal. And um, so this has almost been the case for a long time. Uh, you know, there's some details that are added in. But for the LSST, it looks like the image on the right, which uh, I, I credit Jim Chang and the DC2 team for creating this so-called quantum graph, which is a directed acyclic graph. This is a computing 
uh, theory kind of thing, but it also helps orchestrate the jobs that are um, needed to process a single image. So on the right is the kind of process that needs to happen to get a single image to look ready for science. And um, so, yeah, all the boxes on the right, the light gray ones are data products, usually calibration things or reference catalogs. The dark gray boxes are um, particular instrument signature removal tasks. Um, and so some of these processes take just a few minutes. They're easy. You just subtract one thing and move on, but others take hours. You have to kind of, you can see some of these um, things go into separate areas and you have to unite them and you have to kind of um, feed them back in and rerun and things like that. And so it, this whole process is very complicated, very impressive. And uh, in, in theory, what comes out of the bottom is a perfect image of astronomy. Um, but right now, you know, this is a research project. And so we've got a checklist of things that we've noticed in the images and we need to correct. And for a lot of these things, uh, there's a column here and this image is credit of Merlin. And um, he's probably rolling his eyes. This is an old image, but uh, this, this is kind of like a little checklist of whether or not we're ready for this type of thing. And is there something in the stack to correct these effects that we've noticed? And so far we're doing pretty well. We're checking things off. We've added some things to this list and certainly we'll probably uncover some more things. And actually we've removed a couple of these lines through optimization. Um, so um, yeah, that, that graph on the previous page includes some of these effects, but not all of them just yet. And so that graph will certainly get more complicated. But the main point is that uh, we can't really assume anymore that science images are just this raw image minus the bias divided by the flat. It hasn't been true for a while, but it's definitely not true now. And that's because Rubin will have such tiny statistical error bars on almost every science topic you can imagine that uh, if you don't remove some of these effects, you will, when you <laughs> make your measurement, you're not going to get astronomy, you're going to get something about the camera. And we want to make sure that's not the case. So one of the ways that we can do that is um, through simulations and checking, you know, if we put it in, can we take it back out again? So uh, instrument signature removal for DC2 is basically a process of insert <laughs> some sort of error and then try to undo it. Uh, and try to undo it in a realistic way too. You know, you have the answer, but you want to undo it in a way that you would when you're on the mountaintop, you know, a couple of years from now uh, with the information that you're given from the camera. And so, um, yeah, so those beautiful ray trace simulations, you know, complex numerical in-body simulations of the universe evolving over cosmic time, wonderful stuff. And then they add all this ugly noise so this beautiful image on the top, uh, this is just one of the steps where uh, we've made it harder for ourselves, but it's, it, it should be a little bit more realistic in terms of a challenge to remove the things that, that are put in. And so from the top image to the bottom one, you're adding this kind of segmentation. Each channel of this one CCD has different gains and different offsets. And so you can add those into these this top image, make a realistic kind of noised up image, and then uh, you can try to remove that through calibration. And also you can see these little rings here. These are not gravitational waves passing through the universe or something like that. These are unfortunately tree rings. Some, it's a property of all silicon in almost all CCDs that are out there to some extent. Uh, these um, these tree rings kind of imprint their pattern. And I'll, and I'll talk about um, the top three effects in the DC2 simulation, showing what they look like in reality and what, uh, what's what been done to DC2. And uh, yeah, so I hope that you learned something about uh, this. Um, yeah, so to start out, and also if there's any questions at any time, feel free to interrupt me. Um, but uh, yeah, to start with tree rings, what we saw on the previous page is uh, one of those ring, ring patterns. So on the left, uh, you can see a very messy real sensor. Um, this was one ITL sensor at a 500 nanometer wavelength. And so you can see that segmentation of the image. Those are all the amplifiers that all get read out simultaneously. And then you can also see this little ring pattern. And uh, you can measure this very precisely on all the sensors and kind of develop a model of what's in the focal plane. 
And that's what's been done for DC2. Um, you can put a radial displacement function that will modify where the electrons, the photoelectrons, you know, created from photons that hit the silicon, they start falling through the silicon, but they feel these little rings, which are caused by dopant or ion impurity gradients. And then, so those electrons can fall into like neighboring pixels, depending on whether the gradient is positive or negative. Um, and so this is actually, this is a, this is a research topic that's ongoing right now. Um, the, the systematic that's imprinted by this is, you know, a thousandth of a pixel shift. And that sounds really small, but when you collect tens of billions of objects and you measure them hundreds or thousands of times, this sort of thing can be visible. You can see it in the dark energy survey data, for instance, and they've developed a correction method for them. Um, but the question for us is, this was input into DC2, this model, and uh, it, is, it, is it going to be something that will contaminate, um, for instance, the three cross two point correlation function you know, summary, where you're correlating shears and positions and things like that. Maybe this sort of signal will leak in. In lab data on the bot, on the focal plane, we've actually put grids of spots, fake stars, and uh, shown them, you know, shine that light onto the focal plane and move them around to simulate observing. And then you can look at how these spots are displaced from their nominal positions. So on the left is that astrometric shift input, uh, the difference between the input position and the measured position. And so you can see that recovers that tree ring pattern, but now in astro astrometric shift. And this is in pixels. That's, you know, thousands of a pixel we're measuring this tree ring pattern. But if it's shifting the positions, if it's shifting electrons, it's also going to be changing the way you're measuring the second moments. So you can, again, make a similar measurement, uh, kind of a null test that uh, all of these stars should be the same size. They shouldn't change when you go over these ring areas. And, uh, and, but they actually do, and they change by maybe a tenth of a percent from the peak of the valley, from the peak to the valley. And also the ellipticity of the objects changes also about a tenth of a percent from the peak to valley. And um, so, so again, this, this effect was input into DC2, but I do not think that it was uh, removed in any way and certainly not removed to uh, a, a perfect level. And so this is something that you can keep an eye out for. And that's kind of what this talk will be about is that this signature has been input into DC2. Has it been removed properly? people might find it when they start doing correlation functions of shears and positions. And so, um, so keep an eye out for something like this. And also this work was done by a, um, a graduate student visiting at Slack, uh, Johnny Estevez. And uh, there's lots of lab data to, uh, to be working on, more than we can even handle. So uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, let me know. Um, we're always looking for people to look at our data. Um, so yeah, the tree rings, that's, that's one problem. And that's probably the first problem that both real, um, real objects and simulated electrons will encounter in the sensor. Um, the second thing that they'll encounter is the so-called brighter fatter effect, which has become maybe the tallest pole in terms of Rubin processing. Uh, this was an effect that has kind of always been around in the data for CCD surveys of the sky, but uh, you kind of sweep under the rug. And so what's shown in these plots is on the y-axis, the size of an object, and on the x-axis, the brightness. Here, it's the central value in electrons. And so yeah, as, as you can see, as that central peak increases, uh, here's 100,000 electrons right here. The full well of the detector is about 200,000, so maybe out a little you know, towards the right plot. but over half or a quarter of the full well, there's about a half a percent increase in the size of objects. And uh, so on the left is a simulation of charges being collected uh, using realistic silicon you know, parameters and just following every electron. And so as one electron gets collected, the next one that comes in will see that collected one and will be like, oh, I don't wanna be near that guy. And he'll, they'll get diverted off to the side. And so that, that causes this broadening. 
This has been put into GalSim and also the image simulations for DC2 in the way seen on the right. And as you can see, the Poisson simulation in the way that it's been added into GalSim agree pretty well. And that's good. Um, yeah, and so this is just a little graphical representation. So there's no charge in the left pixel in these electron paths going from 90 microns above the pixel wells to zero. Uh, you can see that with no charge in the central pixel, all of the all of the subsequent electrons rain down and fall into their correct positions. But with the brighter, fatter effect, which is always always there, uh, subsequent electrons they see more collected electrons in that central pixel, and then they get diverted off to the right hand side. So this leads to that broadening that we see in data and also the simulations. So in data, you know this kind of plot is something that I think a lot of people might make for DC2 and also for Rubin images. And so historically, this plot has also been made a lot magnitude versus flux. And this is one way you can find stars um, to use for PSF measurement and things like that. But if you look at this, uh, this plot, the brightness as the object, as the stars get brighter, you can see they also turn a little bit to the right in terms of flux. And so this is this is supreme cam data. This is like uh, LSST like data. And you can see this tilt here is exactly the same tilt that you see on these right hand plots. And so we need to correct this. Um, one way to correct this is to kind of deconvolve the effect from all of the data. And that's what's shown in the top right. You, you have the effect on stars and then you deconvolve it with a little kernel and you can get the stars to not have any trend in uh, brightness in terms of size. And so that's good. It works really well for stars. One of an, an ongoing research topic that we're going to deploy this test for the full focal plane is uh, whether or not this is true for elliptical objects. Um, for round objects, the correction method makes perfect sense. For elliptical objects, there are some questions that you can raise about whether or not this deconvolution actually will correct properly. And we've got some data with elliptical objects on real sensors. For instance, this one little postage stamp we put on there. And you can see applying the same correction that corrected round objects actually doesn't correct elliptical objects. And that would be a problem. That would be a really big problem for LSST. It would cause kind of like a you know brightness dependent shear calibration or a redshift dependent shear calibration. And uh, either of these would be kind of bad things to have inside the data. And so this is another thing to keep in mind when you're looking at the data is that this effect has been put in there. And if you see some worrying trend and you know size versus redshift when you've normalized, taken out everything else, maybe that's it, it's this effect leaking in. So I'll keep an eye out for this sort of thing. Um, you shouldn't see, you know, if if uh, you shouldn't see that brighter stars are broader than narrower stars on average or, or, or dimmer stars on average. So um, so yeah, keep an eye out for this brighter, fatter effect. And I have a notebook that shows this bottom right figure. Um, so we can go through that later as well. Um, and so, yeah, the third one of the top out of the top three effects, this this is the third one, crosstalk, which I think a lot of people are familiar with in terms of two wires next to one another. One wire has a signal on it. And just from electrostatics, from Maxwell's equations, those two wires will couple to one another and you'll kind of have one wire stealing charge in a way from the other. And you see this on the LSST focal plane, for instance, as Greg mentioned before, uh, we've been simulating satellite streaks across our CCDs. And one of the things that happened when I simulated satellite streaks on our CCDs was we got this horrible grid of <laughs> uh, streaks back. And it was like, oh no, it, it really brought home the issue of crosstalk and the way that these satellite streaks will interact with our focal plane. Um, just the way that we operate the camera, how fast we, we suck out all of those electrons from the focal plane means that this coupling is unavoidable, this coupling between channels. Um, and so we've been studying it and thankfully we've been able to remove a lot of these effects, but it's also required kind of a breaking of an assumption in our uh model of the focal plane so we're still working on this but uh this effect of crosstalk is also in the data i don't think there are satellite streaks in dp0 or dc2 maybe in the next simulation but uh the crosstalk is and so for bright stars 
for instance, say it's not a satellite streak, but there's a bright star right up here, you would see a spot in the segment next to it and a slightly dimmer spot in the segment next to that. And farther away, maybe it's a negative spot or across the midline break, it's a negative spot. And so <clears throat> in theory, all of this, again, has been removed perfectly for you. And you'll never see if you were to take a correlation function of all bright stars and look 500 pixels away, you know, whatever that is in terms of arc seconds, you should never see any sort of signal. But, you know, it's worth checking. And I think that's an easy test to do. That's kind of a null test. You know, you shouldn't see any correlations in the resultant data that are separated by like camera related parameters. Like 500 pixels is the distance between one amplifier and the neighboring amplifier. And so if you see a correlation on that scale, it means that maybe there's some camera artifact still in the data. So keep an eye out for, for effects like the ones that we've mentioned, uh, crosstalk and that sort of thing. Um, and so <clears throat> I've kind of gone through the top three effects. As I showed before, there's a bunch of things that we could talk about, but um, I think it's also nice to show some code. And so there are two notebooks that I did for the Stack Club. Um, one of them is the brighter fatter correction. So this was showing again with uh, elliptical objects, how if you correct it with this kernel on the bottom right, this is the thing that you're gonna deconvolve every pixel of every image in Ruben data. This, kern so this kernel or something like it will touch every pixel. And so we need to make sure that this is working as intended, um, certainly. And um, so, yeah, when you apply this kernel to an image that's, you know, in subsequent images, brightening, 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 um, do you get a flat shape versus flux plot? Um, not necessarily for a lot of objects. And also because this convolution is shifting charge around, you may actually be uh, shifting charge outside of given apertures for measurement. And so, um, yeah, so there may be some charge that's lost externally to the CCD by this convolution or, or lost outside of a given aperture that you're using for measurement. And so it's something to keep, keep in mind that this effect is in DC2 and it will be in the realistic, in, in images of the sky. And, and in both cases, it'll be removed to, our, to the best of our abilities, but something to keep an eye on, keep an eye out for. Uh, and there was another notebook that I made kind of for fun, but it's following a research topic that I've been curious about for a while and it's related to undersampling. Um, and so in this notebook, you use Gaussim to make all of these spots. And this is a the stretch of the bottom right image is just to show where, where all the spots end. But these are all just Gaussians of uh, just increasing size from very small pixel scale objects to much broader, you know, kind of unre unrealistically big stars. And what you can see in the top right, for instance, is so you know what you put in, you can measure those objects with the stack. And what you get out is a difference. So on the blue curve is an adaptive moment, HSM moment. And so you can see for input sizes that are on the scale of a pixel to about three pixels, this error is on the order of 1% or a few percent. Um, and so a lot of the objects that are in the LSST are, are actually within this range. Their stars and things like that will be in this size range. And so there will be a bias in the adaptive moments for HSM uh, that will be in the catalogs if this measurement system continues as is. Uh, similarly, you could, you could weight it. Uh, you could weight by uh, some factor or um, you can also introduce a correction for the pixelization. And you can see it's this correction that I introduced in this notebook actually removes this effect up to a certain point, but then um, uh, some of these undersampling problems creep in again. So um, these are all kind of, th these two notebooks are kind of uh, take a peek behind the scenes and how the sausage is made. And uh, maybe we can take a vote to do one of them, but. Uh, I think perhaps the brighter, fatter one might be worth going through, but um, I could just conclude here, um, just keep it short, and then we can decide what to do next. Uh, this, the, the key point, I think, to keep in mind is that Ruben will be systematics limited. There will be so much statistics that what's going to be the limiting factor will probably be the systematics that we've 
discovered and tried to correct, and also the systematics that are un undiscovered and we'll find as time goes on. You know, as the data gets deeper, we'll, we'll also have deeper data on our systematics. And so we'll have to, it'll be an ongoing battle, but I, I have no doubt we'll be victorious. And uh, hopefully through the help of people like you looking at the data and, uh, and all of that, but uh, for now, DC2 simulations have uh, many realistic effects that have been added in. And um, these simulations, uh, they're based in reality and they are, they've been corrected as best as we can using methods that we'll use when the survey starts. But, you know, is this good enough? People have done plenty of checks and tests of this massive simulation, but there's so much data we can't possibly look at it all by ourselves. So you guys can be the judge. Look at the data in a new way is what I'm suggesting. Keep an eye out for all sorts of strange effects. And if you see something, say something, I would say. Uh, and uh, so ways you can look for uncorrected systematics. You can compare inputs and outputs, uh, the truth table, uh, that, you know, what, what was input and what was measured. You can look for signals on scales related to the camera, like that crosstalk thing, 500 pixels away. Um, if you see a signal on that scale, it's probably not astrophysical. Um, and so, yeah, just looking at the data in any non-astrophysical way, you know, you should get no signal when you, you know, correlate the shapes of stars or something like that in the final catalog, you should get nothing, you know, unless the stars are being, you know, aberrated by something that's un- uh, unastronomical. So um, null tests, are, it's kind of a way to summarize all of that. Um, you can perform null tests on this data set in so many different ways, so many different catalog values, image properties, like just test things, two, two column values that shouldn't be related. Are they correlated? Well, yes, they are. And then they've become correlated somewhere along the measurement process. And so uh, that needs to be disentangled. And sometimes that disentangling isn't done exactly properly. So keep an eye out is what I'm trying to say here. Um, and so, yeah, there's one final slide that I slipped in here at the last moment. That's really fun. Uh, I'm full of all sorts of silly ideas. And one of them is to put DC2 actually onto the LSS TC CDs. And so with the help of Michael Troxel, uh, who did a lot of the image simulations for, for DC2, he, he rendered DC2 at space, you know, Hubble, better than Hubble resolution. And he gave me some little pieces of the DC universe, which I printed out on my home laptop here in the garage. And that's what it looks like on the right, this little slice printed out. It's very nice, actually. The resolution of commercial printers approaches that of you know, the pixel scale. And so you can almost have a one-to-one -one re -imager with a pinhole and a paper DC2 universe. And in the middle is what you get. This was my first attempt at doing this, but further attempts will follow. Uh, so you can see that this, you know, these bright central galaxies are in this image here. And so all sorts of little details, some shearing and things like that. Um, and so I think this may present a fun way to uh, see what the DCT universe actually looks like on sensors um, and whether we can correct all of the actual effects and return to this uh, pristine image that was input um, so this is just another test that, that, that we're working on, but, um, but I thought it was a fun thing to, to add. And so, um, but yeah, I think the conclusions here are basically all I would like to say about this. I can share some code next, if you like. Um, my daughter is now onto the, onto me and maybe interrupting us a little bit here. But uh, yeah, we can talk about either of these notebooks if you like, but also if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thanks so much for that talk. There are some questions that have come up in the chat uh, while you've been talking. I think Merlin has handled, I think most of them. I'm just gonna do uh, another quick thanks, scan Merlin. through them. Um, yeah, I think Merlin has answered most of them, in, um, like about spider legs and then about the um, CCD coatings. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. 
It's Leon. Uh, and then the other question had been about adding satellite trails, but you showed an example where you had added satellite trails uh, to a yeah. 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 These aren't in the DC2 universe. I think this was uh, this was kind of a recent worry and back in about 2019 when they first started uh, getting launched, we realized that this would be a problem. We put some streaks on sensors, but this was after DC2 was uh, <clears throat> invented and begun. And so maybe the next iteration. Yeah. We'll have those, but it's it's an ongoing problem. And uh, yeah, we've. <laughs> We've actually influenced SpaceX and Elon Musk with our studies on Rubin sensors. You know, we've, uh, through our outreach, <clears throat> have caused them to try to darken their satellites even more than they have already. So that's, that's always a good thing. Darker, the better. Are there any other questions? I can pop off screen sharing. You can look. Yeah, there's one for Yannis. Yannis? Go ahead. Yeah, hi, Andrew. That's that was a really nice presentation. Thanks. Um, my, I have a quick question. If we were to want to simulate our own program and add satellite trails or whatever effects, how would we go about doing that? I mean, is there some software that uh, that you have made available on GitHub or something that we can download and store? Hmm. Um, adding it into simulations is interesting. So the crosstalk, that's something that's in the data. And so all you'd have to say is add a streak of electrons pre the crosstalk step. And um, so, yeah, it, I think in the MSIM code and the way that it was run for DP0 is public. And so, yeah, I, I imagine you could probably reverse engineer something like that. <laughs> uh, but we can talk more. I mean, I think the most, one of the most useful things that we've been doing is is putting it onto hardware and and um but also adding it into okay. image simulations could be useful as well because there's so many so many other effects that can get entangled um so, yeah it's a good question we can talk more if you like um, about that. Oh, i'd love to <laughs> okay Andrew, I have a quick question. Um, the picture of the streaks from satellites that you showed, this is primarily around the uh, uh, fairly early on or fairly late on in the night. Uh, what about in the middle of the night? Do you have any effects on those satellites? They're generally probably not illuminated sufficiently well to, to create problems. Yeah, yeah. For, um, <clears throat> for the satellites, the Starlinks, that will be one of the most, these low Earth orbit satellites that um, will be the biggest problem for LSST. Indeed, they're, they're brighter and more visible during the hours after sunset and before sunrise, uh, when the sun and the satellites are in the right orientation to bounce down into your telescope. Uh, but for higher orbit, satellites, you'll see them all night long. And um, those can actually be even worse because they go slower in, in terms of angular speed. And so um, there's a relationship between the brightness of the satellite and its and its radius away from us that can have nonlinear effects. And so, yeah, the, the, the low Earth orbit ones, they'll sometimes during the summer, you'll even see them at midnight. But um, for the most part, it's a uh, it's sunrise and sunset uh, yeah and then there's going to be tens of thousands at other orbits and yeah it's it's predicted that you'll see one in every image uh you'll have one giant line at least every 30 seconds or so we'll see there's another question in the chat about um how people could inject satellite streaks um with the crosstalk effect in DC2, but I think it's very similar to the, maybe what Yanni was asking about, um, tools to inject things into images that might exist. Mm. Yeah, so if there's, if there's a lot of interest, I can think more about this. I, yeah, we're, we are doing image simulations right now, um, not with DC2, but just looking at the way that, you know, these satellites in the images that I showed, there's, it's a very narrow line. These guys are actually slightly defocused because they're a lot closer to us than less than distant galaxies. Yeah, they're. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the PSF will have very broad wings. And so this narrow line will also scatter light out to hundreds of arc segments. And so we're looking at whether or not those 
those scattered light when you co-add hundreds of images and one of them has these faint wings from a satellite not corrected or removed, does that create spurious objects in a co-ad? That's the kind of research topic that we're investigating right now. Our current measurements say that, you know, in a single CCD with one streak, um, that's, you don't mask out the entire scattered light profile in the wings, you can get maybe a handful of objects, um, maybe um, up to a percent of the objects in a co-ad could be these uh, spurious objects. So the main thing would be broaden the mask, block out even more of that light, but then you're losing objects and now you have masks that go across entire regions of the focal plane. And so these are the kinds of things you can think about with the satellite streaks without, um, I don't know, injecting data into the DC2 images. You can just kind of think about like, there's scattered light, those will be co-added. Will you get spurious objects out at the wings? Um, if so, cut it off more, but then you have to know, well, will the mask, you know, masking in this way, will that create correlations as well? So we're kind of looking at it from those two angles, but feel free to think about it some more. We know we, we're, uh, we're doing our best over here, but there's certainly a lot of ideas that can be tested and things like that. So that's, I hope what you take away from this talk is that you guys can help out uh, in a lot of these uh, projects as well, if you're interested, you know, it's also science <laughs> and it's also beautiful in its own way. So Andy, I, I think that, 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 sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I was just going to say that I added um, maybe discussing how to inject or learning how to inject sources into DC2 images would be a great breakout topic for today. So I put that on the list and we'll see if people want to gather and talk about the things they want to do and maybe how to go yeah. about doing it. Um, and then I was also going to say there's at least one request to maybe take a quick look at the brighter fatter notebook if you have it open, maybe sure. in the last 10 minutes before 10 o'clock, just so people can see what's in there and whether it might be um, useful for them. Let's do it. Let's see if we can, we can do that. Um, yeah, so I've got it rendered here. Here's the, here's the undersampled notebook, um, which I, I made a link to in the second to last slide to both of these. These blue guys are links to these notebooks, but I can oh, send a link to the brighter, fatter notebook to the chat window. Let's see here. More chat. There's a link Thank you. to the brighter, fatter, the rendered notebook. And if you go, you know, you delete some of this URL and you'll get back to the stack club and it's inside of the image processing um, folder. But this, this was, um, uh, I did this a couple of years ago using data on the beam simulator uh, at Davis, which is like a, it's a miniature LSST optics and we put on one side pinholes or some scene, you know, made with photolithography the same way that the CCDs are made and on the other side we put the CCD. Hi, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm running out of time here, but uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, so uh, have to this, go, that's totally fine. Yeah, I might have to go here. Uh, but um, yeah, so it just reads in an image and Come here, come here, come here. Are you okay? Almost done. It reads in an image, and these images are, uh, let's see here, where's the directory? Project shared data, beam sim, and then I've got some FITS images in there. That These are actually on uh, the Google Cloud kind of data facility. Uh, they were transferred over, and so these lab real images with these uh, this is what the piece looks like that I uploaded, just a small piece of our CCD, one piece of an amplifier. And uh, so you can process these images, characterization and measurement, uh, these LSST measurement uh, things, characterize image is a part of that complicated uh, quantum graph that I showed. Uh, but you can kind of pull this out of that pipeline and run it on the image and uh, detect them. The detection of these objects is not perfect. This notebook is far from perfect, but uh, these are all the measurements that you can make on it and the, all the measurements that were made. And uh, so yeah, detection, mask planes, um, and then you can do astrometry and things like that. But um, 
the main point of this was to use this uh, this kernel that I showed before. So this kernel was derived <laughs> from data and uh, used this kernel to iteratively deconvolve the input images. And so you can see the difference before and after. You can see you have uh, dark central central areas and brighter wings. That's what this kernel is doing. It's redistributing the charge. And then, so what you can do is you can run that yes, characterization yes, on yes, uh, yes, yes. on the corrected and uncorrected yes, images, and then yes. compare and then compare the two measurements, yes. uncorrected and corrected. And so, for yes. a galaxy, for instance, yes. size on the y-axis yes. versus yes. brightness on the x-axis, uncorrected is red, so you can see they trend upward with brightness and then you correct them with this kernel method and then they trend downwards. That's not a good thing. This uh, more round objects looks more reasonable. It's trending upwards and then it starts to saturate. That's when it really takes off is when the charge starts to bloom. But even before that, you can see this little trend here. So that's that's classic brighter fatter effect in red and then green it's corrected pretty much flattened out. Um, for more elliptical objects, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This very vertical one, I mean, sometimes this, I think this is a clue as to what's going wrong. Um, this very vertical guy, you know, has a different brighter, fatter curve and it's corrected in an incorrect way. So this notebook is a couple of years old. Things have been changed a little bit since then, but the basic principles are all the same. And so this is a test that you can do um, in lab data, but you know, the, this sort of effect you could also see in DC too. So look at brighter objects compared to dimmer objects. So the size is um, different. Uh, and also you can, yeah, one of the flux measurements you could make um, before and after there's a flux difference for different objects and you can see it kind of trends off. And so even in a very broad aperture, 25 pixels away from the central objects, you're still losing flux. And, you know, this is just systematics and we're, we're just trying to figure them out and uh, we'll be repeating this test on the full focal plane um, in just about a week or two. So you can stay tuned for more results regarding this. Hopefully that wasn't too fast, but the, the code is all there, the data is there, and you can look at it if you'd like and ask, certainly ask me questions. Don't hesitate to email me. I don't know if I added my email to the slides, but um, yeah, I'm Andrew Bradshaw. Send me a message. If you like. Yeah, that should be definitely enough for people to get started and at least go to the notebook and pull out the pieces um, they need. And you're yeah, probably you're um, in the Ruben community forum as well. People can direct message you. It's easy yeah. to reach out. Um, Don't hesitate. Okay. Do we have you for the time of one question? Yeah, yeah, I think she's setting <laughs> back in a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, Will, do you want to ask your question? Um, it's in the it's in the chat, but I was wondering whether the um, the the details of the correction kernel for brighter fatter, uh, whether they depend strongly on the background level. So I'm thinking if this has to be applied to, you know, the outskirts of a star cluster or a crowded stellar region, um, whether the background is higher, if that changes the kernel one would use compared mm -hmm. to distant galaxies in ultra deep field or something. I love it. I love it. Well, these are, it's a great question. You know, it's something that we've, we've asked that same question and it's a, it's hard to simulate that. <clears throat> you can actually, you can simulate that, um, you know, in, in code and with fake pixels and fake electrons, uh, it gets a little complicated when you start to add, you know, millions of extraneous pixels to yeah. a central star. Um, but it does, it, it changes the way that, you know, the potential that an incoming electron sees yeah. will be changed if there's a yeah if there's a threshold of if there's a sea of electrons there and then that that one star that it's coming towards it's you know it's it's less of a less of an obvious effect and so yeah I think this sort of thing will be a sky level dependent okay. thing and yeah in in outskirts of galaxy clusters will probably be corrected slightly differently than the inner regions of galaxy clusters these types of things these are next level to what we're already doing right now but it, it is again something that we we need to worry about so yeah definitely if you're interested oh thank you since more questions yeah thanks for that Th th thanks to your daughter for giving you time to answer the question <laughs> thanks leona <laughs> uh, 
right. Do we have time for one more question? If we do, uh, did hyper supreme cam people have seen the brighter than the father, the brighter the uh, effect, and how do they manage to correct it? Hyper Supreme Cam absolutely sees it. Every every camera with pixels and electrons will will get this effect. Uh, CMOS will as well, and it'll be different there. But yeah, they see it. They correct for it. Uh, the correction is not perfect, um, and yeah, it's an ongoing research project. But yeah, it's the, I mean the the HSC project uses the the Rubin data uh, management, uh, the people and the code. And so it's it's in there. The same thing that we're using in that notebook is pretty much what they're using for HSC. So yeah, it's in there. Thanks. Okay, well, it was, again, it was a real pleasure to speak with you guys. And um, yeah, I hope that was fun or interesting. And if, any, if there are any questions, feel free to ask me offline. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Andrew. Round of applause for Andrew. I don't Thank see you. any more well, it's really great. questions in the chat and no more raised hands. I, yeah, I think we're all good, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, so now that we're at our halfway point, I'm gonna share my, I'm gonna refresh the slides and reshare my screen and we'll do delegate profiles and then we'll do some, we'll set up some breakout rooms. So for delegate profiles, looks like we've just won for today. Um, Alessandra, are you here? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. Hi, um, so my name is Alessandra Gorsi. Don't mind the background that was from a conference I had uh, given yesterday a talk. Uh, I'm associate professor at Texas Tech University uh, in uh, centrally isolated Lubbock uh, in Northwest Texas. Um, I work on strip envelope core collapse supernovae and gravitational wave follow-up, uh, mostly using radio telescopes, uh, but I need the optical to collect triggers and decide what to follow up. Uh, so that is my uh, major interest in Rubin. So far I've been doing these things um, with data from PTF or ZTF, and um, I'm looking forward to expand those uh, uh, studies with Rubin. With DP0, I just uh, came in, and so I'm trying to familiarize myself with the platform and data products, and the ultimate goal would be for me to understand among the many uh, transients that Rubin will detect, which ones to pick for further follow-up in the radio. Um, and then I had a, I have a little plot there showing um, the gravitational wave event GW170817 radio detection. So I hope to do more of that uh, with Rubin as well. And thanks for giving me the time to introduce myself. Hey, thanks, Alessandro. Thanks for being here. And thanks for um, volunteering to do a delegate profile also. Okay, looks like. We don't have any more profiles for today, but we're going to keep doing them next year as well. Seems like people are enjoying them. So let's um, go back to our breakout room topics, which you can get to.